the Lord Jesus Christ took steps down to get here, but then he also gets exalted back up. Philippians 2, 9-11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So number one, his name is exalted. In Genesis 11, in chapter 4, the people who were building the Tower of Babel said, Let us make us a name. Many people are trying to make a name for their self or trying to be the greatest as something. These things are pointless because the name of Jesus Christ is truly the only name that matters and the only name that will reign supreme in the end. You might as well realize you are nothing and bow down to his name. Number two, he is exalted in people acknowledging who he is. Verse 10 says, every knee should bow, every knee shall bow of things in earth. That would include men like George Carlin, Bill Maher, the Marilyn Manson, Richard Dawkins, and every atheist. These men will believe he is God. They'll know for sure that he's not just some imaginary character. Even these men who people look up to as gods like Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, LeBron James, and others will bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. The verse also said every knee should bow of things under the earth. The devils will bow down and everyone that comes up to the great white throne judgment out of hell will bow down. Satan who had been in the bottomless pit for a thousand years will bow down and say, Jesus is Lord. They won't say Jesus Christ is the Lord, but rather Jesus Christ is Lord. As Christians, we know that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and he is the one who lives inside every saved person. He is the one we will stand before at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.11 refers to this time as a terror. And many people today are always talking about terrorists. When it comes to this, the Bible says, Be not afraid of their terror. In 1 Peter 3.14 Their real terror is at the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus is our high tower. 2 Samuel 22.3 says, The God of my rock, in him will I trust, he is my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. At the judgment seat of Christ, you will see a real tower of terror. Knowing this, we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. People are always talking about how scary the great white throne judgment will be. But the judgment seat of Christ is said to be a terror. We're, no, we're not going to be judged for our sin, but we are going to be judged for our uh, service or lack thereof and about our motive for doing things for God. And it's going to be a shameful thing getting there and not having any, any service done. But Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God has already worked in you all the right things you need to live as a Christian. It is up to you to work it out. Working out your own salvation has nothing to do with maintaining your salvation. It has to do with living the right life after you're saved. Someone who works out at the gym wants to get better physically, while the one who is working out his salvation with friend trembling is trying to get better in his Christian walk and mold himself into being more and more like Jesus Christ. Spiritually, you are already like Jesus Christ if you're saved. You need to do your best to make your walk in the flesh and your everyday life match the way God sees you and sees the inner man in you. When you got saved, you got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. God took away your sinful record 
that was applied to your soul and gave you Jesus Christ's sinless record. Jesus Christ never sinned one time and then died for your sins. And when you believe on him, God takes Jesus Christ's perfect, spotless record, applies it to your record, and takes away your filthy record. You were sanctified, which means set apart. You were sanctified once and for all. But there is also a daily sanctification where you need to try and live right in the flesh. See, when you got saved, your spirit was born again. But your flesh wasn't born again. Your spirit, which is the new man inside you, never sins. Your flesh can still sin because it is still corrupt until you get a new body at the rapture. We work out our own salvation with fear and trembling when we keep our flesh under control. Here's some ways to work out your flesh or work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You do this by studying. See 2 Timothy 2.15. You do this by winning souls. See Proverbs 11.30 by praying. See 1 Thessalonians 5.17. By mortifying the flesh, see Romans 8.13. By being ready to fight spiritual battles, see Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. By living by being a living sacrifice, see Romans 12, 1 through 2. And by finishing your course, 2 Timothy 4, 7. And not only this, but Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Murmurings and disputings are works of our sinful flesh. People have been destroyed for murmuring. In 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 it says, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. They were going around complaining under their breath, complaining about God, and just never happy, just complaining about everything. Uh, Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Like I said before, in the spiritual sense, we are already blameless, because Jesus Christ was blameless, and we have His righteousness. But daily, we should try our best to walk blameless in the flesh. For someone to be blameless, they would need to be doing everything they knew that was right. Whatever God has revealed to you that is right, you need to do those things. Doing those things doesn't make you any more saved than you already are, but you will definitely come out better at the judgment seat of Christ. When you stray off from doing what is right, then you should confess your sins to stay in fellowship. Your relationship with God will still be the same. You will remain a child of God, but to stay in unconfessed sin, you get out of fellowship. God will always see your inner man holy and sinless, no matter what you do in the flesh. Your flesh is never going to be sinless, but the new man inside you is always sinless. Before Paul was saved, it says he was, according to the law, blameless. No one ever kept the law completely. When they broke the law, they would offer the prescribed sacrifice and would then be again, according to the law, blameless. And for born-again believers in the church age, in the New Testament, for us to be blameless, we should do the things that we know to be right. And then when we mess up, we should confess those sins Try our best to do right and stay in fellowship. When we fail, we should always confess our sins. Don't let the hyper-dispensationalists make you think that confessing your sins is not for born-again believers in the church age, because it is. Uh, Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So, the, it says the sons of God, we are sons of God. 
the new versions will say for John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son uh, that's a lie because God has more sons than just Jesus Christ they take out the important word begotten in John 3 16 in the new versions but our King James Bible said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the verse also says in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation it is a nation that is crooked and perverse like America if a nation isn't straight it's crooked America is trying its best to sensitize you to transgenders and sodomites and everything else perverted and backward if you're not straight you're crooked America is definitely a crooked and perverse nation but we should shine as lights in the world Psalms 119 105 says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path a good way to shed light is by speaking the words of God someone who is blinded by Satan and blinded by the things of this world and their sinful flesh they don't like the light the Bible even talks about them hating the light and when you shine the light of the Bible on a sin that they're doing they get upset they don't like it and it hurts their blind eyes compare it to a man who is in a deep sleep in a dark room and someone comes in and turns the lights on it hurts his eyes and he gets upset because it's it's hurting his blinded eyes Philippians 2 16 says holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain if we hold forth the word of life we're going to come out better at the judgment seat of Christ if you don't keep the Bible in your hand reading it studying it and meditating in it daily then you won't be walking a Christian walk or having a chance to attain rewards at the judgment seat of Christ Hebrews 4 12 says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and then look what Psalms 149 6 says it says let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand so we're holding forth the word of life we've got the two-edged sword in our hand we should hold forth the word of life many people won't touch a bible and many will touch the bible with the plans to change what it says i don't want to change what the king james bible says i don't want to correct it i want it to correct me the word of god is profit profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness I don't correct it it corrects me Romans 1 18 talks about men who hold the truth and unrighteousness we as Bible believers hold forth the word of life knowing that it corrects us but they hold the truth and unrighteousness they hold the Bible in their hand and don't care to change the words they aren't holding forth the word of life if you're holding forth the word of life then you are reading it and doing what it says and proclaiming it shining light on a crooked and perverse nation so Philippians 2 16 holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain if the Philippians do this hold forth the word of life then Paul says he can rejoice in the day of Christ he can rejoice when he sees them get their rewards at the judgment he won't feel personally that he has labored in vain if they will walk like Christians even though he knows deep down that no labor for the Lord is in vain as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 58 Philippians 2 17 and 18 says yea and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith I joy and rejoice with you all for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me He's saying he would be willing to sacrifice his own self and own life for them to live a godly life and that he would rejoice to do that. Philippians 2 19 and 20 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state. These verses show that Paul has confidence in another man besides himself. He had confidence in Timothy and knew he would naturally care for their state even though he couldn't find anyone else that was like-minded 
more than ever today people are out for themselves and Philippians 2.21 says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Every born-again believer belongs to Jesus Christ, and we should seek to help them. When we do something for another Christian, we are really helping Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.22 says, But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. One of the best ways to get to know a person is by working with them. Timothy saw Paul as a spiritual father and he served with him like a faithful son. Sometimes the only proof we have is someone's word. But Paul had served with Timothy and fought alongside him in spiritual battles. Philippians 2.23-24 through 24 says, Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Paul honestly believes he is going to get out of prison and be alive to come to them again. Philippians 2.25 says, Yet I suppose it necessary to, ten, to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion and labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Notice the, the great qualities about Epaphroditus. He is a brother, companion in labor, fellow soldier, messenger, and minister to the wants of Paul. Calling him a brother shows Paul knew he was born again. When you see that word brother, Paul's referring to a saved person. Calling him a uh, companion in labor shows Paul has also worked alongside him and gotten to know him personally. Epaphroditus is also a fellow soldier who has fought spiritual battles with Paul just like Timothy. The fact that he ministers to the wants of Paul shows that he isn't seeking just his own wants but the wants of other Christians. Notice it also says about him in verse 26, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So he was worried that would that they would worry about him sick, being sick. This shows that the Christian life isn't like the prosperity preachers teach. You can live as good as Paul or Epaphroditus and still get sick. The Christian life done right won't make you rich and without sickness. This verse also proves that Paul has lost most or all of his gifts of healing. And Benny Hinn and these other fakers are false apostles and liars according to the Bible. Philippians 2.27 For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. We need God's mercy even after we are saved. All it would take to bring us to our knees on the ground is a tiny stomach bug. And God can bring the biggest and strongest men to their knees with something as small as a kidney stone. We are nothing and we need God's mercy. Paul is thankful God had mercy on his friend. And Philippians 2.28 says, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. He believes they will rejoice when they see he is healthy. And then Philippians 2.29, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. And hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Epaphroditus picked up the slack of the Philippians, who had a lack of service toward Paul. He wasn't regarding his life, but rather doing the work of Christ, even though he was deathly sick. He was setting his affection on things above and being heavenly minded. But this is the end of Philippians chapter 2.